when you look at anything like a face or a car, the perception of that thing is built up from very basic filters and elements that exist in the eye and elsewhere in the brain that basically take the visual scene around you and break it up into dark lines and light lines and moving things and the direction they're moving and then creates these perceptions really that this best guess about what's out there okay. so for instance if i draw two dots on a piece of paper and a line right below it and i show it to you you will get a slight sense that that's a face right but if i were to draw the line vertical in less so and if i were to draw the line you know um uh curved and off to the side, you would never think that was a face. What that tells us is that our perception of faces is built up from these basic component parts. And indeed it is. So there's this kind of what's called a hierarchical models. And this is how we perceive everything, um, hmm. everything. Um, so a song has its component parts of tones and et cetera. Um, so when I look down the microscope, you know, there's an ability to for us to shrink our, our perception into that narrow space and time domain and to kind of get lost in it. But what's remarkable about the human experience and actually what's remarkable about being human, um, and we don't think other animals have this, although we don't know for sure, is that we can deliberately expand or contract our space and time perception. I can make the decision to be in this Zoom and, and, and narrowly focused. I can make the decision to expand my thoughts. I can um, and, you know, nowadays there are, people talk a lot about ADHD and ADD, some of which is clinically valid attention deficit disorders, some of which is just kind of being distracted. We are having a harder time nowadays because of the number of things pulling us out of this like, kind of tunnel of focus. That said, I think that human beings have evolved and thrived on largely on the basis of people's willingness to stay in a narrow aperture of experience. So learning to drive a, a race car and then to race at the level that you have and to do the other things that you've done requires a either a love of and or a dedication to being in a pretty narrow aperture set of experiences. Oh, exactly. right? And to not life, actually, it's funny. I, we, I can talk about that, but that's exactly right. Yeah. And I think that inside of those narrow apertures are we create new milestones and rewards. And this gets, it speaks to the kind of the reward systems of the brain are pretty generic. Um, they relate to dopamine and serotonin, mainly, mo mostly dopamine. Um, dopamine is this incredible neurochemical that makes us feel motivated and in a state of craving and drive. Well, you think about when you're in a narrow aperture of say, pursuing a school degree or uh, pursuing uh, a win in a, in a race, I mean, it's as if this system, which is indeed very generic dopamine, you're now saying, okay, the currency of reward is not the dollar or the Bitcoin or the Euro, it's dopamine. And I'm going to superimpose that onto this narrow aperture of experience. Now you finish that. And then the, you, a healthy person says, um, a healthy athlete or student or physician, whatever says, um, okay, now I'm going to make the dopamine about the healthy relationships of my life or that my health, my bodily health, the unhealthy entrepreneur, parent, athlete, et cetera, hat can only derive dopamine inside the narrow tunnel of that one experience. Right. And, and, the, and in that sense, it's very much like true addiction um, mm -hmm. drugs like cocaine, amphetamine in particular, but other drugs as well for some people, alcohol, but not everybody, they create, a dopamine loop whereby the drug is the only thing that can really give that intense dopamine release. And so the way I define addiction as opposed to a healthy focused pursuit is addiction is a progressive narrowing of the things that bring you pleasure, right? Whereas a being a healthy person means you have three, four, 50, a thousand things that bring you pleasure. So you're able to take this very basic system and use it for different things. So, um, all that said, you know, this narrowing of aperture is fundamental to how we arrive to be the dominant species on the planet, right? We're in charge, not the house cats, because somebody took the time and really got excited about building tools <laughs> um, that house cats, if they had the idea in mind, they actually never made it happen. Uh, so, it's, you know, these systems of focus and expanding focus and shifting focus, and then the reward system, which is universally dopamine, a few other molecules also, but mostly dopamine. 
That's been used over and over and over again, not just for 100 years or 1,000 years, but probably for hundreds of thousands, if not millions of years. So is dopamine the only driving force in why we seek to accomplish something? Um, great question. Uh, I would say it is the primary driving force. It's it's supported by other molecules. So um, we can very clearly state uh, from a place of, I think, great confidence that dopamine is the molecule that is creating motivation, craving, and drive for things that are outside our immediate possession or experience, beyond the confines of our skin. So seeking new relationships, seeking a new uh, item that you want to buy, seeking a degree, seeking a win, seeking a trophy. Okay, seeking. But there's another set of rewards that have to do with the feelings of pleasure that we derive from things that we already have. Um, that we experience this very intensely around um, close relationships with people or animals that we feel kinship with and we great, great joy from their, their mere presence, right? Yeah. You don't need to seek them. They're just there. It just feels good. Um, yeah. The meal that you're currently preparing and eating is very different than the food you're trying to hunt or go buy to, to, to eat. Um, and the second reward system is mainly governed by the molecule serotonin. It's more of a, of a calm sense of reward. And I, we can say that because dopamine, the molecule dopamine is actually biochemically converted into adrenaline. It actually is the, the thing from which adrenaline is created. And adrenaline is what gives us energy to move, not caloric energy, but neural energy to go pursue things. Serotonin is much more woven into the systems of the brain and body that make us feel not just willing, but perfectly content to stay still. Like, ah, oh, it's really nice here. I really love this, you know, the feeling of this person. I don't produce enough serotonin. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think the two systems compete um, and there's a, and people are, are, you know, skewed one way or the other somewhat. Um, there are skills and things that one can do to learn to access these different systems. Um, and there are other reward systems and motivational systems too. Um, the so-called endogenous opioid system, we all can make these endogenous kind of painkiller feel good molecules. These are not the opioids of the opioid crisis, although the molecules are exactly the same. The opioid crisis is due to companies making a synthetic version of this soothing painkiller molecule and then putting it in a pill that provides it at very high dosages. Now that has clinical uses. Like if you go in for a surgery nowadays, they'll prescribe fentanyl almost mm -hmm. always, but of course they can be abused and they have, they're highly addictive because normally we don't experience fentanyl levels of opioid circulating in our body unless we've you know run a hundred mile race and we're trying to save our family from famine or something, perhaps just as an adaptive mechanism. But yeah, I would say that dopamine is responsible for most of what humans have accomplished, yeah. and and those who are able to access it. And I have to you know presume that this is um, probably what your experience has been. I mean, that ability to set a goal, a milestone and work toward it. Oh man. Only driving force. Literally. That's when people ask me why I, what I love about racing. I was like setting a goal and achieving it. Yeah. Well, and, and dopamine is interesting because it, it obeys a very simple set of rules, which fall under the umbrella of what's called reward prediction error. And when you hear this, it's sort of a duh, but we know this from re literally recordings from neurons using electrodes or imaging if you suddenly get a, a surprise that you like, dopamine is massively released and it gets you all excited and motivated to pursue yeah. of what you think preceded that. Okay. Finding, I don't know, for a kid walking along the street, I don't know when I was a kid, finding a hundred dollar bill would have been like, whoa, like check this out. This is a lot of money. Um, if you are pursuing something or someone or any kind of milestone and you don't reach it, there, what happens is dopamine actually increases in anticipation of potential rewards, not from the reward itself. A lot of people don't realize this. And if you don't get that, let's say you are hell bent on a gold medal, not silver, not bronze, but platform gold medal, and you end up with a silver, your baseline of dopamine drops below what it was prior to the pursuit. Athletes know this, right? Dude, I've lived this my whole, I mean, oh, gee, ugh, am I screwed? No, it, you know, cognitive, the, the beautiful thing about the dopamine system 
is that the prefrontal cortex, which is involved in planning and decision-making and rationalization is also wired into the system. So one can say, okay, that was a learning experience. And I, the rewards came from okay. the fact that I didn't get bronze or whatever. We can reframe, but okay. in, in the strictest sense, that's the way dopamine reward prediction error works. Now, the other thing is also true, which is that if we are in pursuit of something and then we achieve it, there's a positive feedback loop whereby the brain and nervous system better remembers all the steps that led to that successful completion of the milestone. So this is wired into the so, oops, excuse me, into so-called neuroplasticity, which is our brain's ability to change. And so you start thinking about how success breeds success. Yeah. That's all about dopamine. Wow. You start thinking about how failure, you know, people start creating this narrative, especially in depressive states of like, it's just not worth trying anymore. In some ways they're protecting, they're subconsciously protecting the dopamine yeah. they still have. And, and I was fascinated to learn that recently there've been studies showing that people who have chronic pain, the pain itself actually starts becoming wired into this dopamine system. It's very interesting. You know, there are these people who um, are always talking about their pain. Sure. Always talking about, it. it's almost like, gosh, like for somebody who's not in chronic pain, it, that can be very perplexing and sometimes even yeah. annoying. You're like, gosh, this person, like all I hear about is the hard relationship, the hard, the pain. Yeah. Right. But in any case, the, the, that system can start becoming its own reward mechanism whereby the thinking about the pain actually starts to trigger dopamine release. And so this is a, a rather, this is a uh, adaptive flipping the circuit. So there's a lot of dimensions that this could go, but for somebody who's very driven, who wants to be the best, who has a milestone, I would say two cautionary notes. One, first, first of all, that's beautiful and that's wonderful. And that's a lot of what makes life rich. Two, one needs to make sure that along the way you are registering the wins, the the milestones, setting mm -hmm. some closer horizon milestones. Yeah. Yep. And then the third is that the schedule of reward that works best for keeping people in a healthy state of mind of pursuit is one of the same one that the casinos use to extract money from you, which is random intermittent reward. Here's what I mean. The slot machine, it does. it's not every 10 pulls that keeps people playing a win every 10 pulls. It's the randomness of it, right? As soon as you're ready to walk away, you get a win and then it keeps people going. This We can apply this in our own lives that, and this is especially true with kids. It's great to reward your wins, mm -hmm. but every once in a while, take that gold medal and just say, don't say it wasn't good enough, but just go right back into living life and pursuing new new pursuits. What, what I've seen over and over again is that people that are very driven become so attached to this dopamine reward system mm -hmm. that they get the, re the, they reach the milestone, excuse me, and then they feel depressed. Well, why? Because dopamine is released by pursuit, motivation, and craving, not by reaching the reward itself. So the journey being the destination is a, is a dope, again, a dopaminergic, as we say, phenomenon. Oh, so it's important to have goals, perhaps very lofty goals, the long-term ones so that you stay in the pursuit for longer. But then, like you said, you need the incremental goals to stay satisfied, essentially. And correct. And, and to keep you driven. So dopamine, it's, do there's a beautiful experiment that illustrates this. This has been done in animals and, and just by way of natural circumstances in humans. You, let's talk about the animal experiment because um, it's simply you take two rats, separate cages. Um, rats like food and they'll lever press for a, a piece of chocolate or something tasty, especially. Um, they can achieve pleasure. Now you take those rats and you put them behind a little wall or they have to do some work, like climb over the wall to mm. get to the lever. Both of them will do that. Now you take one of those rats, and again, this was done with humans as well, and you deplete its dopamine. You put them in right in front of the lever, both of them will sit there and eat the food. Dop dopamine is not required to experience pleasure. But now, if you remove the wall, but you put the rats just one rat length away from the lever, what you'll notice is the one that has dopamine, because it's a normal rat, will walk towards the lever, press it, and get the food. 
the rat or person who does not have dopamine won't even move one body length away to reach pleasure. So the key takeaway here, whether or not you're a highly driven person or not, is that rewards achieved without prior effort don't tap into the dopamine system. And they basically will cripple an organism or human at the level of the mind such that you can't really experience pleasure the same way.